Perfect. Thank you. Good. <laughs> All right. Very good. It'll work much better if uh, if you guys are able to follow the, the slides set along the way. So good. Thank you, Anna. Um, very, very well. So um, you know, I've, I've been uh, at Minnesota Eye for for quite some time now, and um, have developed a, you know a keen interest in ocular surface disease. And in our practice, we uh, you know, see we, we call we, our, our practice is what we call an anterior segment uh, group, where we see a lot of patients that have uh, uh, problems or, or, or pathology of the front part of the eye. Um, of course, we also see uh, patients urgently, so we'll work closely with other doctors that take care of the retinal uh, surface, or the, the retina as well. Um, uh, in this setting, I've been uh, taking care of a lot of folks uh, around their uh, surgeries but also a lot of uh, patients that have ocular surface disease and have developed a, um, a strong interest in this area. <clears throat> so again, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me tonight. I, I put together a quick course outline uh, for us. I'd like to start off by kind of briefly going over uh, some of the statistics on ocular surface disease, uh, and then we'll follow that up by a brief discussion on uh, definitions. There are a lot of different terms that have been used and kind of, um, uh, you know, at some point, you know, it, it can be very, uh, for, for the provider, it can be very uh, important and, and um, provide an accurate description, but at times also can be uh, or might be confusing for the patients. And so talking about the definitions or the words that we're using these days to describe the instability of the tear film or dryness or ocular surface disease and we'll kind of talk about what each of these terms that I just mentioned um, you know kind of point to and then we'll talk a little bit uh, very briefly about uh, the basic anatomy which I think is important when we're um, kind of trying to, to picture uh, you know uh, how these things relate to us individually and then um, I wanted to specifically talk about two very pertinent um, things that have uh, really change the way we look at diagnosing and treating this condition, the lacrimal functional unit, and these very important glands called the meibomian glands. Um, I'd like to also talk about what are some of the tools that we're using now. It's a very exciting time for a doctor of optometry or, an, or a uh, dry eye or ocular surface disease specialist. <clears throat> now we have a lot of uh, very um, uh, sensitive uh, and specific tools that we can use um, as a point of care test while the patient is in the chair we can run some very um, you know important uh, tests that help us to point us in the right direction and develop the right diagnostic plans uh, so we'll kind of go over a few of these that are um, key in any ocular surface disease clinic and and those that you'll probably hear your provider refer to and then I'd like to go over one patient profile and our basic uh, treatment, uh, you know, strategy. Um, <clears throat> to start off, I'd like to ask a quick question when we start off here. Um, how many people do you think suffer from the symptoms of dry eye in the United States? And then we'll give you a few minutes here to kind of look over the, the options. And then Anna, if you'd like me to, if you just let me know when you'd like me to continue. Yep, we'll do. We've got about 70% of people voted so far, so we'll give a few more seconds here. Thank you. All right, I am going to close the poll and we'll see the results here. Is that showing up on your screen? I haven't seen it on my screen. Um, okay, it looks like we kind of have a tie. 43% say 10 million, 43% say 25 million, and 14% say 7 million. Oh, okay. Okay. So those of you that answer 25, this is the right, uh, this is the right answer. Um, so very, you know, uh, uh, significant condition that's affecting a large, large group of people. You know, oftentimes we don't really think, um, you know, something like dry eye is affecting that many people across the country. It gets back to, you know, when I was talking earlier about our practice, we see a lot of patients, for instance, that might have other conditions like glaucoma um, uh, and uh, other conditions like, um, you know, corneal problems that might 
require surgery, you know, these patients sometimes will end up developing dry eye symptoms as a consequence or a sequela from, from a primary, from, from other conditions. So some patients have dry eye and that's it. And then sometimes patients will develop dry eye. So it's a very, very common uh, condition that affects quite a, you know, a, a significant number of people. Um, in 2012, there was a Gallup poll that looked at 751 patients uh, and, and just kind of uh, looked at uh, what are some of the trends that they see there. So 62% of the patients, of those patients really uh, reported they did, discussed dry eye with their eye care provider. And their, this dry eye uh, topic was really not the, the main reason that they went in to, to see the doctor. And so again, kind of like those patients, as I mentioned earlier, that might have another condition like glaucoma or other patients that maybe have come in for a completely routine visit, when asked certain questions might say, oh, well, I, I sort of, yeah, I, I have that symptom. Um, and so they might actually kind of, when in the doctor's office, sometimes you ponder things a little bit more and you think about the condition or the symptoms and this, then you might realize that, oh, this, this really actually does you know, affect me in some way. So 62% so of the patients out of those 751 reported that they, they did have symptoms, and, but it wasn't the primary reason that they went in. And the reason why I put those little bullets there is, be, is because it oftentimes dryness or ocular surface disease might be um, not considered a priority. And so I, I urge all of my, my patients that might be uh, coming in for other conditions to also focus on the symptoms from this very important condition. Um, and so, so likewise, we have to think of it also as providers as something that is just as important as any primary reason that the patients might be coming in. <clears throat> And so the, out of that same Gallup poll, um, there were, uh, in, in a, in a, the, the projections are that this uh, condition is not only affecting a lot of people, but also uh, we expect that there's going to be a, a continued growth, at least in this Gallup poll up until the year 2022. And so my, my sense is that I think this 10% growth is probably a little bit of a low estimate. I think this is, this is actually based on uh, the population, uh, per, you know, the... Um, uh, it, uh, I'm sorry. The, uh, so this 10% this is actually a projection of the, the population only. It doesn't really take into consideration other factors like Pay, you know, folks having a little bit more access to uh, pay to uh, health care and folks not having or uh, folks uh, uh, having certain growth trends in different uh, segments of the population as, as with uh, with minority groups. In that same Gallup poll, uh, there were uh, patients that uh, we saw that there was 66 percent of the patients had a um, uh, used the majority of those patients had artificial tears that they were using for two two or more years. 66 percent of those 751 patients. Another interesting finding was 48 percent had been using artificial percent of those patients had used them at least several times. Again, 53 percent said, "Well, that doesn't really provide." significant relief. It's only temporary relief. It's really surprising to me after seeing this group of patients for many years how much dry eye patients will basically kind of put up with to some extent. And so I have patients almost every day that will come in and say I've been using you know drops for you know four times a day for the last you know uh, you know year or two and in some, some cases those patients use those lubricating drops much more frequently, and it just becomes a routine. You, be, you become used to doing it, and you're, you get into this routine of masking a problem that actually has a different etiology or another, another cause, not just dryness. <clears throat> and so it's a very, th those numbers were really interesting to me the first time I saw this. There's really very little 
that I can you know, say about my job where I know that the majority of patients, almost half of patients, follow a certain trend with any disease state. And so those numbers were very, were very telling for me that we, there are a lot of folks that are suffering from this and maybe they're not uh, being treated uh, either aggressively enough or the treatment isn't really hitting the underlying reason for the problem that's causing their symptoms. <clears throat> Here's a little um, slide that um, I uh, will we'll kind of show a nice little diagram of the tear film. And so the critical pieces here, this is the front part of the eye, of course, on the left side. And then we have the little green uh, area there is the, called the mucin layer. And this is, what, this is what anchors the tear film on the surface of the eye. And so the tear film really uh, has three different components. There is the mucin layer, and then there's the water or the aqueous layer, and then there's the lipid layer or the oily layer. And so this oily layer essentially preserves the rest of the tear film. And it's this oil or lipid layer keeps the tear film from evaporating very quickly. And so the aqueous part of the tear film uh, is, is a very... Uh, is a very rich part of the tear film that affects the, uh, the, the stability of the overall tear film. The mucin layer, as I mentioned, is, is the layer that anchors the tear film. And are you hearing, are you hearing me very well? Yes, I can hear you fine. Perfect, thank you. And so, so this is the, the, the part of the, the uh, the, one of the main things that we uh, think of when we consider the tear film is that it is a three-layer, uh, uh, you know, tear film on the surface of the eye. It's not just a matter of having enough water or adequate water. There are three main components, an oil layer, a water layer, and a mucin layer. So the second point that really I wanted to drive home is that this, this concept of the lacrimal functional unit. So in order to really understand uh, some of the things that are driving the symptoms of our patients, we really should think of, of our anatomy as, as not just the front part of the eye or the tear film or the cornea, but we really have to kind of zoom out a little bit and think about some more structures. The letter A on this slide is pointing to what we call the lacrimal gland. That lacrimal gland up there uh, on the sort of the ear side of the, this would be the right eye of this patient, is responsible for delivering the water part of the tear film. So it contributes to the aqueous layer of the tear film. Letters B and E point to the opening of the, of the nasolacrimal duct. Basically, this is a channel that takes your tear film from the surface of the eye or the part of the eye to down behind your nose. And so this little channel is actually very important uh, for uh, many conditions that can lead to the symptoms of ocular surface disease or dryness. And so the opening of this uh, channel is called the puncta. There's an upper puncta and a lower puncta. So on the upper lid, letter B is the upper puncta. The lower lid, letter E, is the lower puncta. And then there's a little channel that takes the the tears from the puncta over to the letter D, which is the lacrimal sac, and then the letter G is the nasolacrimal duct that continues to take the tears from the surface of the eye to behind your nose. So it's really important to think about the lacrimal functional unit and this whole diagram and understand at every step, is there a problem at every step of the lacrimal functional unit that could be contributing to the overall problem. Now, the tear film, as I said, is, has three different major components. Now, within that tear film, you'll see that there's, it's much more complicated than, than that. There are a lot of uh, little, uh, it's a very uh, you know, protein-rich uh, part of the eye that has a lot of little electrolytes and different enzymes and proteins that have very specific roles 
to maintaining the structural integrity of that tear film and homeostasis or the, the baseline normal functioning of the tear film. And so there are uh, iron uh, proteins or lysozymes, all kinds of other molecules called cytokines. These cytokines uh, can be uh, important when we have an inflammatory condition on the surface of the eye. So if we have too many of these cytokines that become active, they start to break the bonds between the cells of the surface layer that's, that resides right underneath that tear film. So the tear film is actually very complex. It's not just one layer. And even within this uh, complicated three-layer tear film, there are all kinds of very delicate and important molecules that are keeping that tear film functioning the way that it should. And so the pharmaceutical industry's way of, of, of really trying to help patients that might have symptoms due to instability of the tear film comes close, but it doesn't really uh, mimic every, every little uh, important role that these molecules take on in the patient's normal or healthy tear film. Okay, now, so this, this, this little review of the anatomy then begs the question, well, what is dry eye? What is the real problem that we're talking about now? And so really the key is dry eye, what we used to call mainly dry eye, <clears throat> is instability of the tear film. And so it's not a function of just dryness. When patients come in saying, you know, I have a lot of foreign bodies, sensation and we look in to their eyes and they have instability of the tear film, that instability of the tear film is not only due to dryness. And in fact, in most cases, it's not only dryness. So we do have, obviously, patients that have the water part of their tear film is not functioning as well as it should. Or the quantity of that water part of the tear film is just not um, abundant enough. But oftentimes, in my experience, that's a part of the overall problem. And so really what we used to just call dry eye, we're finding that it's, of course, much more than that. And there's a, a set of conditions that lead to instability of the tear film, and that is what is, tri is, what is triggering, triggering the symptoms in most of our patients. So after we understand the health of the overall lacrimal functional unit, we get a better understanding of how we can improve the stability of that tear film. And so instead of using the term dry eye, there was a group of excellent you know, doctors that came together and, and formed this group called the International Task Force. And they suggested that we start using a term called dysfunctional tear syndrome rather than dry eye. And I agree with that. I think that's a, that is a, a term that comes much closer to describing the overall problem uh, you know, compared to using the term dry eye. And so they suggested that at times it can be very confusing for our patients that come in and their, their main symptom is that they're tearing too much due to instability of the tear film. And then we look at their eye and we say, well, the real problem is dryness. You have dry eye. Well, that can be very confusing to the patient if their main symptom is excessive tearing, which might be reflexive in nature. So if your kind of reaction, your reactionary tears are, are working, um, you know, kind of overboard, the underlying reason could be the instability of the tear film. So dysfunctional tear syndrome is a much more accurate way to describe the global picture that we often see with our patients. Now, um, in addition to instability of the tear film and dysfunction of the tear film, there are a bunch of different ways that that can be affected. And the research is really driving at inflammation is the key to all of these factors that end up affecting the instability of the tear film, such as allergic conjunctivitis, blepharitis, you know, rosacea, all these different terms that end up and end in the in the term itis means basically an inflammation of that part of the eye. Conjunctivitis means that there's inflammation in the conjunctiva. Blepharitis means there's inflammation in the eyelid. And then rosacea, and a lot of patients, especially here in Minnesota, will have facial and ocular rosacea or eye rosacea. Those are the patients that you might see that have kind of red nose and red cheeks. 
and then a generalized conjunctivitis or kind of um, pleading or chalasis. Pleading of the conjunctiva can also cause a lot of inflammatory debris to end up on the surface of the eye and that debris or that inflammation causes the tear film to break up too fast. And that's really the underlying reason for the instability of the tear film or the dysfunction of the tear film. So rather than call it dry eye, most careful ocular surface disease uh, you know, specialists are really describing, using uh, these words to really describe the process in much more detail. And so dysfunctional tear film or dysfunctional tear syndrome is further classified into two different main buckets. The first one is aqueous deficient, where the water part of the tear film is not thick enough and it's not abundant enough. And then the other group of patients we call evaporative dry eye patients or evaporative uh, patients. And so those patients have a problem with the lipid or the oily part of the tear film. That part of the tear film is just not thick enough and therefore not preserving the other two layers. So these patients might come in in a perfect mucin layer that anchors the tear film in a perfect water layer, but their overall oily layer or their, their oily layer that, pre that preserves the tear film isn't really all of that together. And so they have evaporative disease. And so these, these but all of these syndromes really um, have, uh, the, uh, these classifications of dry eye have inflammation affecting them in some way, in some way. Now, um, one of the most critical parts of the functional unit, of course, the lacrimal functional unit to really take a very careful look at is the eyelid. And so there are a lot, there are a lot of uh, research that has pointed to us, actually most, the majority of us, don't really close our eyes completely during the day or while we're asleep. But there are some, the, some patients that really have an incomplete blink or incomplete closure that is much more uh, significant for those patients because it essentially leaves the bottom one-third of the front part of the eye um, unprotected, uh, especially at night. So those patients are, of course, most vulnerable um, at night if they don't close their eyes um, completely. Well, there's a very simple test that we do in the office by putting a, a bright light onto the upper lid. It's called the lid light evaluation. And there are a lot of clinical studies that have looked at patients that have this positive lid light or you know, an abnormal finding, uh, having more symptoms when they first wake up in the morning. So you can see on the upper picture uh, here on the, your left-hand side, that patient really, with that bright light, you can't really see um, much of a, uh, of a line of the light escaping from the upper and lower lid. On that picture on the bottom, right, up, right below that, you can actually see some of the light there is escaping and you don't have complete closure on the patient that's on the bottom picture. And so this is a very, very simple test. And if you have noticed that for some reason your eyes bothering you, your eyes are bothering you, and you're, you're bothering you more when you first wake up in the morning. It could be something very simple as an incomplete blink. Uh, and, and, there's some, and there's certain things that we can point directly to that as being the main reason why uh, patients have their symptoms. Now, the meibomian glands, of course, are a very uh, critical part of the assessment of the patient that comes in with uh, symptom instability of the tear film or ocular surface disease. It accounts for about 80% of patients with dysfunctional tear syndrome or instability of the tear film. So, and this is based on uh, you know, significant clinical studies that have looked at those two um, main categories of aqueous deficient patients and evaporative patients. So those patients were all evaluated and it turns, it turns out that the meibomian glands or those glands that line the lower lid are very critical in 85% of those patients. Those meibomian glands produce the oily part of that tear film which is very important again for uh, the stability 
of the tear film and not causing the tear film to evaporate too quickly. It's very common in patients that have other skin conditions such as seborrhea or eczema or dermatitis, rosacea. Um, and so those patients usually will come in with mild dysfunction of those meibomian glands. And the proper uh, identification, of course, is really, really critical uh, for assessing these glands. So we can't really tell if the glands are healthy or not by just looking at them, at, even with large magnification. We have to gently express those glands. And depending on how that oil comes out and the, uh, the consistency of that oil, we don't really know if those glands are healthy or not. In fact, the first stage of the condition called dysfunction of the meibomian glands, the first stage is what is called non-obvious meibomian gland dysfunction. So, so sometimes we can actually you know, detect that the glands are dysfunctional uh, without, uh, uh, but, but not really having that um, thick secretion when, they, when it comes out. So it's a, it's a problem that can be missed easily. And the only way for, our, for us as, as providers to really uh, see if those glands are functioning well is uh, to express them or gently uh, express them or push them basically with either a Q-tip or an eyelid forceps. Here's a little diagram that shows uh, those, those glands called the meibomian glands as a kind of a cross section. The picture on your left hand side shows a meibomian gland that is functioning very well. And so you can see that there's a little arrow in the middle of it. That arrow is pointing to the oil being delivered from the gland to the surface of the eye. And so that it basically looks like a little grapevine. That central duct is where the oil travels from the gland to the surface of the eye. All those little pockets on the sides are called acini, and they uh, this is the area where that very important oil is made. And then the gland Every time you blink, very sensitive muscles around that gland squeeze and they, they contract and they squeeze that gland and the gland delivers a healthy layer of oil to the surface of the eye. And so that's why the blink is, it turns out, to be a very important part of the health of the eye. And so blinking in the blink rate, if that plummets, for instance, while we're doing a lot of computer work or reading a book or anything up close, mostly screens, that can really contribute to the symptoms of dysfunction of the tear film. The picture on the right-hand side shows that same meibomian gland once it's become plugged up on the top. And so that little sort of red area right on at the top of the opening of that central duct has now become obstructed. And so the oil can't really make it past that area. So actually what happens is something called reverse flow where you see the, the arrow is kind of pointing in the opposite direction now. So the arrow, it, it starts to actually, the oil starts to move in the wrong direction. And instead of delivering that healthy oil to the surface of the eye, it actually starts to move in the wrong direction and the gland starts to um, atrophy. So these, those little pockets you can see on the right hand side those little acini, they're smaller in size now, and they're red because they're becoming inflamed. And then the central duct is a lot thicker because it's, uh, it has all of this unhealthy oil that it just can't deliver to the surface of the eye. And that is the beginning of a process that we call meibomian gland dropout and meibomian gland truncation. So the gland actually starts to um, atrophy and go away essentially with time if this process is not addressed. And so this has been identified as one of the main reasons that we have the evaporation of the tear film prematurely. And so in, again in 85 percent of the patients that we see it is the problem with these glands that affects the tear film so that the oil just can't be delivered to the surface of the eye and the rest of the tear film starts to evaporate too quickly. So those patients might come in and they have perfect numbers as far as their mucin layer and their aqueous layer, but it doesn't really matter how perfect those two parts of the tear film are if there's nothing preserving them on the surface of the eye. And so here's a little diagram that shows that on a patient. On the left hand side, as you can see, there's a kind of a a picture which is really not very smooth, 
uh, you can see the patient's eyelid there, and you can see the green part is the tear film. We stain it with a stain called fluorescein, and then after a blink, we can really evaluate the dynamics of that tear film. There's something called a tear breakup time, and so we basically ask you to blink, and then keep your eyes open and count how many seconds does it take for that tear film to go away or dissipate. Uh, and, and so in the healthy patient, that should take about 10 seconds or more. And patients that have instability of the tear film, that, you, that sometimes will happen much quicker than that uh, within a few seconds or so. And so the picture on your left-hand side there does show instability of the tear film in a very irregular surface. The picture on the right, of course, shows more smooth tear film, um, a, a tear film there on that right side. And so this becomes absolutely critical for stability of the vision as well. So stability of the tear film is directly correlated with stability of the vision. As you can imagine, if you're kind of you know, driving your car, you'd much rather uh, be looking through the windshield on the right-hand side, not the windshield on the left-hand side. And so instability of the tear film can really affect the vision. In fact, I hear this every day that a patient might come in and they say, you know, my, my vision is really good right after I blink. And that's all due to the instability of that tear film. Again, if that progresses and it's uh, addressed aggressively enough, instability of the tear film will then lead to damage of the surface of the skin layer of the eye that sits right underneath that tear film. And so there are very, very sensitive corneal nerves that sit right underneath that tear film in the epithelium or the skin layer of the cornea. And so if these, uh, this part of the eye really has uh, a tear film that's not protecting it for many years, these patients can really have um, you know, significant symptoms and really tough disease. And so addressing these meibomian glands is really critical. Now, moving into the diagnostics section of our little presentation tonight, one of the, the, the main things that you'll see in your examination is a reference to osmolarity. And so it basically is a, um, as this is a test that's been studied for 30 to 40 years, there is a significant uh, number or amount of data that uh, correlates osmolarity with a healthy or an unhealthy tear film. Uh, it basically what it does is it measures this, the concentration of salts or solutes uh, in the tear film. And that really correlates uh, perfectly with a very, a very sensitive uh, uh, rate with um, instability of the tear film in an unhealthy tear film. And so if a tear film is hyperosmolar, that uh, is a tear film that's not very healthy. And so uh, this, again, has been uh, studied in great detail and has now become the standard of care for evaluating patients that have instability of the tear film. It's a threshold test, and you can see the little scale on the bottom of the slide. Generally speaking, uh, 308 is the cutoff, and so if patients are you know, 320 and above, we consider those patients having uh, mild or moderate in the moderate category of, of patients that have uh, dry eye disease or ocular surface disease. Patients that are 290 or 305 or so or, or less than that typically have healthy tear films. The other uh, interesting thing about it is patients can also, though, they can fall below that 308 cutoff that's been accepted as the general cutoff uh, by, by eye, care doc, uh, eye care providers. Um, the other important piece, though, is that asymmetry or a difference between the two eyes of eight units or milliosmoles per liter also is a sign of mild eye eye. So we, don't, we not only look for an abnormal number on either eye, but we look for symmetry or things being the same, basically, between the two eyes. And so this is really a, 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 an important test. And what we do with this test is we don't really look at it as a one-time evaluation of the surface of the eye. The important thing to look at here with osmolarity is looking at patterns. And so patients that have a normal tear film, which is that, that picture that's up and to the right, uh, to your left side of this slide, usually have low 
osmolarity readings, and those readings are very consistent. Uh, as they develop a little bit more uh, dryness or un un instability of the tear film, on that graph that's right below it, you see the numbers become a little bit more irregular, and they can kind of hover around below the 300, but they're, coming, they're becoming a little bit less uh, regular. And then as they move to a moderate or severe dry, of course, the readings can really vary quite a bit from one, from one test to the next. <clears throat> the interesting finding is that with osmolarity, patients can have a normal and normally uh, and, and, and symmetric readings in both eyes, but that can also mask early mild dry eye. In early mild dry eye, what happens is that lacrimal gland that we talked about earlier is kind of, it kicks up into hyperdrive, and it's really functioning at a very high pace, but at some point it kind of gives out and is not able to maintain that pace. And so sometimes an, an osmolarity reading might not really coincide with what the patient is saying, what your symptoms are, and what we're finding as the doctors. And that's why we look for patterns of osmolarity readings, not just what is the reading on any one given day. The other important test that we run is called uh, LipaView. And this, this test uh, measures the um, oily part of the tear film. So we can actually give you a, a measurement of the thickness of the oily part of the tear film when you come in to see your eye doctor. That's really, to me, really pretty amazing technology to be able to measure something with that level of precision in an office visit and not have to send a, you know, a tear sample off to a university somewhere to analyze it and bring, bring back that data. So really exciting stuff for us to be able to offer to our patients. And the other uh, piece of uh, very important uh, diagnostic um, data that this same machine gives us is an image of those meibomian glands. So we can actually use this very um, high-tech sort of uh, imaging of the glands to see are the glands healthy or are they atrophying. So if you kind of follow me, if you look at the left side of this graph on the left column there, you can see that top uh, picture where it says normal gland structure. You can actually see, we can actually visualize each individual meibomian gland and then we can follow that eyelid over years and again look for patterns to see are those glands still healthy or are they getting um, blocked or dilated or atrophying. And so the picture that's just uh, still on the left hand side there on the, the picture that's right below the, the one that says normal gland structure, you can see actually gland duct dilation and a little bit of dropout. So you can actually see the glands along the lower lid, and right in the middle there, there's a section where there used to be glands, but those glands have effectively dropped out. Those glands have atrophied, and now there is no oil that's being produced from the middle part of that patient's eyelid. And then the bottom, again on the left-hand side, the left column, that bottom picture shows something called gland truncation and dropout. And so as we continue, if the, the, the patient that's in the middle there, if we didn't get to that patient early enough and start some treatment, then that dropout continues. And you can see the patient that's on the bottom on the left-hand side there, you can see little signs of meibomian glands. Those are basically the remnants of the meibomian glands. There's significant dropout and shortening or truncation of those glands. And so the, the rest of those pictures there basically just show us um, how those images look after applying uh, some technology called adaptive translumination and dual mode imaging. And so it just allows us to be able to visualize it a little bit better. But really, really terrific uh, technology for us to be able to show our patients and to be able to, for us to see if this condition is progressive or are we doing a good job and is it nice and stable? And so what we want to do is make sure we stay ahead of this and make sure that those glands don't continue to atrophy because if they, if they all drop out, it is very difficult to keep that tear film preserved and keep it from evaporating too quickly. This is the research that led to uh, the LipaView uh, technology. 
It's based on some refractile properties of the tear film, and you can actually see this little picture of uh, up on the upper left-hand corner. It shows how a healthy tear film looks. It's supposed to have this nice refractile properties that we see as a result of having a healthy oil layer on the surface of the eye. And so this is also one of those threshold tests. And so it is generally accepted in the clinical research that a uh, number or the thickness in nanometers of the oily part of the tear film, which is 60 nanometers or, uh, or higher, is a uh, chance if, uh, that you'll have a healthy and stable tear film. And so if that number is a lot lower than that or a lot thinner, then you have much higher chance of those meibomian glands having uh, this function. And that's what that MGD stands for. And so the lower that number, the more potential there is for those glands to have disease. And then here is another little diagram. This is just a, a patient of mine. You can see the one on the right. You can see that the quality of the tear film just looks very different. You can actually see the oil. The patient on the left-hand side has what we call a tear film lipid layer deficiency. And so that number is way below the 60 that we discussed uh, earlier. And the patient on the left-hand side has much more of an evaporative component to their problem. Now, the last test that we, or the other test that we typically will um, do, uh, you know, during your, your visit in an ocular surface disease assessment is a test called Inflamadry. This test measures one of the very pertinent um, molecules that, again, is also very highly correlated in dry eye patients or instability of the tear film. It's called MMP9 is the number, is the, the molecule that this test actually tests. That, uh, that molecule is responsible for actually taking away or breaking away the bonds in between the surface cells or the epithelial cells. And so it's another threshold test. Basically, we, we um, run, we dab this on the lower corner of the eye and wait for it for a few minutes. And then if there are, it's a, it's a threshold test. If there's a high number of those MMP molecules, it'll give us a, a reading that shows two distinct lines rather than just one blue line. And so again, another way for us to, as, as your doctors, be able to understand, are we helping you enough? Are we being aggressive enough? Or do we need to change our treatment strategy? Do we need to be more aggressive or less aggressive if all these tests are, depending on what these tests are telling us. Okay, so those, that was the series of slides that talks about what we have at our disposal um, for diagnostic tests. And now, you know, one of the things that I really wanted to make sure I get the opportunity to, to briefly touch on is that sometimes patients will be perfectly healthy, you know, they don't have any significant um, inflammation in the eye and they have no underlying uh, you know, problems or conditions or no glaucoma and no um, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or any other tough condition, but they're on some medications that are basically the main culprit. And this is not limited to just a few medicines here and there. This list actually keeps um, you know, growing and there are a lot of medications that are becoming a part of this list of medications or oral medicines that can contribute to instability of the tear film and some uh, symptoms. Antihistamines, antidepressants, anti uh, high blood pressure medications, acne medicines, um, and of course cancer treatments if, if the patients have had um, you know radiation or chemotherapy that of course really um, uh, affects the instability of the tear film, decongestants, and then sometimes Parkinson's medications if they're the concentration of Parkinson's medicines can of course dry the surface of the eye. So that's really important. Now, uh, so I ask a lot of my patients to describe to me how they, their eyes feel. But really what I'm asking is, how's your tear film functioning? Because a lot of these symptoms that patients tell us, burning, foreign body sensation, fluctuation of the vision, stinging, um, you know, difficulty with my contacts, my eyes are really tired at night, all of these symptoms um, are oftentimes associated with that instability of the tear film. And patients sometimes just don't know that. 
and a lot of times my patients will come in and they're not they don't really know exactly what is the 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 main uh, problem that is is bothering them the most and oftentimes they don't know exactly what could be the main culprit one of the main pieces to get straight is is for us as doctors to understand sometimes patients that have dryness or instability of the tear film will come in saying the number one thing that bothers me is my eyes are itchy and sometimes patients that have mainly a allergy problem will come in saying the number one problem that's bothering me is not itching but it's dryness and so um, those symptoms can oftentimes complicate the overall picture and so um, we have to know um, how all of those diagnostic pieces fit together and then listen for key things that you as our patients could be telling us to describe how healthy your tear film is. Now here's kind of the, 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 the typical patient that I might see a 50 year old uh, female patient who's a fly flight attendant um, there's a lot of computer work but what she is communicating to me is that her contact lenses are less comfortable her eyes are tired and she is one of those patients that's been using lubricating drops 10 times a day for over two years and the first question I usually have for these patients is my goodness you've been doing this for two years um, you know is that is that something that you, um, you know, kind of did that happen sort of all of a sudden or was that something that was that was gradual but this is a big red flag for me any patients have been using lubricating drops often often during the day for a long period of time is using something to basically it's a bit of a band-aid you're, you're helping your eye along for that day but there's a bigger problem there if we're relying on the drops the lubricating drops that many times for that long and oftentimes these patients might come in not because they're really um, struggling um, to fix the problem but they the underlying problem but they're coming in for oftentimes a routine exam or um, coming in for a different reason than these symptoms of contents intolerance or kind of very tired eyes because oftentimes what happens is as I mentioned before if those glands start to atrophy uh, or we start to see some other problems that are contributing to it. It happens at a, such a slow pace, but then once we cross that threshold where the glands, for instance, have atrophied beyond 50%, the symptoms go from being kind of a mild nuisance to really difficult for these patients, and oftentimes it's a much more uh, challenging patient to try to, um, to help uh, at a later stage of the disease. So the earlier we can understand what level of disease we're at the better it is for the patient for that outcome this is not my patient but it's just a, a quick um, image uh, to, to show that sometimes patients you know might think that uh, their doctor might think they're kind of complaining or that it's kind of a you know this is not a big problem <laughs> you know and so I think that collectively as doctors we used to probably think that well this is not really one of the main problems in eye care but it actually turns out to be a very significant problem for a lot of our patients that can have real consequences not just for comfort uh, and um, you know having a good quality of life but also having stable excellent vision so uh, when patients come into my clinic and they're having some of these symptoms and I run the tests of the osmolarity the uh, lip view and the inflammatory and, and again of course take a very careful look at the lacrimal functional unit take a very you know comprehensive examination of the lids the glands on the lids the surface of the eye carefully ask about different medicines that they might be using uh, carefully look at the the patient's history if they have a family history for instance of autoimmune disease uh, or if there's um, you know smoking uh, you know some of the, all these things really affect the, the stability of the tear film so after doing a very comprehensive assessment most of my, my patients I'll start with a what I call the baseline ocular surface disease treatment plan which includes a quality lid wipe um, a high quality uh, fish oil supplement or omega-3s and adequate hydration uh, I also ask patients to oftentimes use non-preserved lubricating drops 
and an eye drop called Restasis, which helps to decrease inflammation on the surface of the eye and uh, help you have a thicker tear film. And so this is my main treatment strategy. When it comes to the eyelids, it's very important to keep dead skin or basically what we call seborrhea or basically flaky skin from getting onto the surface of the eye. And the best way to do that is to use quality lid wipe. And then the other thing that's very important to do for the eyelid is, of course, to keep those glands, those meibomian glands we talked about earlier, keep those glands functioning well. The best way to do that is to put a warm compress on the eye for 10 minutes and then keep it there for 10 minutes, take it off, and then gently massage the lower and upper lid to keep those glands uh, functioning well, kind of like pushing something out of a toothpaste tube, okay? And so we call that warm compresses and lid massage. And so this is the baseline treatment strategy. Patients often, if they do a terrific job of you know, adhering to all of these things, they typically will come back in for their next follow-up feeling better and their diagnostic tests are more normal. And this is my patient after using those treatment strategies. <laughs> so I want to thank you very much for your time.